Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining our uh, last Weave online user group for 2022. Uh, we're really excited that you're all here to join us for our final uh, session. Uh, this is a uh, Weave online user group, uh, as well as we've got various meetups around GitOps community groups. These are all sort of brought together and uh, we deliver a variety of talks on GitOps and related uh, topics often around Kubernetes. So hopefully if this is your first time, welcome. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in future ones, we'll send you the link so that you can join. Uh, I'll say up front as well, we often get the question if these are recorded. Uh, yes, these are, and you'll get an email after this event with uh, the YouTube links, uh, where we have many, many resources and talks like these. So please share in the chat, uh, you know, what you're looking to learn, where you're from. Um, we are here for you, so we'd love to um, provide talks that are useful for you. So let's get started. Um, my name is Tama Onakahara. I'm hosting today's uh, Weave Online User Group. Uh, I run the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks, and uh, our teams have been the creators of Flux and the term GitOps, uh, and we've been delivering these types of talks um, for various years. Uh, we've kicked off um, this kind of winter spring season, so um, keep checking out our talks for um, the remainder of uh, the spring as we will put more on the calendar. Um, today, we're really excited, as I said, uh, to end uh, uh, the WOOGs, at least for 2022, to talk about um, soft multi-tenancy with two great speakers who um, definitely have been living and breathing this. Um, you'll, uh, I'll be introducing later uh, Russ Parmer, who's a senior engineer here at Weaveworks, and um, Priyanka or Pinky Ravi, um, who's on my developer experience team um, as well. What's exciting is that they are both um, living and breathing and um, working on these areas of GitOps with Flux, um, but previously they were both at State Farm as uh, users of Flux. So hopefully we can answer all the questions that you uh, would like answered if you're maybe just getting started with GitOps. Uh, and our flux and um, would like to know how these things work so they can give you both sides of the coin. Move to the next slide. Great. Uh, so as I mentioned, we work for a company called Weaveworks. If you haven't heard of us before, then welcome. Um, our URL is called weave.works. Uh, and so much of what we cover here and uh, what our company is based on has been open source. So we hope that you'll be able to um, try and uh, give us feedback and be part of our community um, by trying out these um, various um, projects that we have. Um, we've had many, many, many more than are listed here, but some of the ones we'd like to highlight, um, of course, as I mentioned, um, Flux is the project that uh, kind of kicked off the whole concept of GitOps within our company and it kind of went like wildfire. Um, within Flux is a project called Flagger that provides progressive delivery. And so um, by that we mean like you can do canary deployments um, leveraging Kubernetes and Flux um, for those um, GitOps capabilities while using metrics from things like Prometheus, Datadog, um, New Relic, et cetera, uh, to um, decide the traffic uh, of your um, canary deployments. And if any of those metrics go bad, then it can roll back. And so we've had um, wonderful people like uh, at Ring Central who use these technologies. They've talked about how you know, Flux has helped their Kubernetes journey um, really accelerate. And then Flagger with the Canary deployments has made GitOps safer for their teams to like be able to move much more quickly on their GitOps journey and to experiment and such. So it's been really great to hear from real users at real enterprise scale on how these um, projects are making a difference. Um, what we're really excited about is that these projects were donated into the CNCF or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, and they just graduated. Uh, um, actually, officially, uh, we um, had our announcement a couple weeks ago, um, so we're continuing the celebrations. So if you didn't know that we had graduated, um, then definitely, you know, join us on um, Twitter, give us a, a um, you know, a, a nice shout out. Um, if you haven't get, given the projects any GitHub stars, then please take a moment to do that. Um, they really do count. So we're really excited that um, we are now at the highest level within the CNCF and truly been validated through, you know, the security audits and um, governance and all the things that we needed to meet um, to have Flux and Flagger um, reach that graduation level. So we're really excited about that. Other things that we have in open source, um, as I said, we're at Weaveworks. So we have a project called Weave GitOps, which is also open source, and it is built on Flux. Uh, so it provides um, a UI and other capabilities 
um, especially if you know maybe you're in the CLI part of the world and you love that, but maybe you have internal app developers um, that need to engage more with the UI, um, then it's a, a wonderful tool that you can try. And again, we'll send you the links for that afterwards. Um, we're also excited that um, Flux is very extensible. So we have many um, more projects in the Flux ecosystem, ecosystem that extends its capabilities. Um, probably the most popular is a Terraform controller, which lets you bring those GitOps capabilities to how you manage uh, Terraform, especially primarily bringing automation um, and a lot of other benefits to it. Um, we're really excited that um, we have a partnership with HashiCorp that we're um, finalizing in terms of like what we can uh, support at the enterprise level. So if you have any interest in that, then please, please reach out to us because we are looking for all that kind of feedback um, that we can put into how we're going to finalize the, um, the partnership. One a final thing I'll also mention in terms of the extensibility of Flux, a really popular tool is this um, visual code Visual Studio Code extension, which now you can manage Flux from within Visual Studio Code. So if you're already a user of that, um, it's become much more uh, continually more popular uh, to use that. And our team's been working on that. It's really excited to see how that develops. Uh, again, we'll send you all these links in the follow-up email. So please check them out and give us any feedback. Uh, and if you'd like to check out our website, it's weave.works. Cool. Uh, I will now hand it over to Pinky to cover the basics of GitOps. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, I'm going to start by like just doing like a brief run through of like what is GitOps Flux and all of that. And I'm sure some of y'all have already heard it, but if some of y'all are new here, then that might be helpful. And then Russ is going to cover the multi-tenancy part and then he's going to show a demo. So um, if you're not familiar with GitOps, it is a... Um, operating model for cloud native applications such as Kubernetes, but if you're doing multi-cloud infrastructure, you can still use GitOps. Um, and especially with like what Tomo mentioned earlier with the Terraform controller. Um, and then it also utilizes a version controlled system, most commonly Git, but you can use um, other things besides Git as the single source of truth. And it um, enables continuous delivery through automated deployment, monitoring and management by a version controlled system. You manage your app infrastructures and applications declaratively with GitOps. So next slide, please, Russ. Okay. So the um, there are four GitOps principles, and these are um, some like a set of best practices that have been defined through discussions with different vendors and end users um, by their experiences by the GitOps working group. And if you do want to find out more about the GitOps working group or the Open GitOps group, you can go to OpenGitOps.dev. Um, and feel free to join us there as well, like in our meetings that we have um, on the first and third Wednesdays of every month. Um, I think that's right, but check the website. Um, okay, so the, the principles are as follows. A um, system managed by GitOps must have its desired state expressed declaratively. So everything needs to be written in code. Um, they're reusable, uh, you know, it, with that it's reusability. Um, there's an audit trail. There's lots of benefits that come from that. Um, and then the second one is that a desired state is stored in a way that enforces immutability, versioning, and retains a complete version history. So there's no sneaking in a change. Um, and then the software agents automatically pull the desired state declarations from the source. And then they also continuously observe actual system state and attempt to apply the desired state. So you get away from things like configuration drift or um, anything like that. And you can be sure that what your, your desired state is, is what's actually out deployed. Okay, so next slide. Um, okay, so why GitOps? Um, there are like three main value props of GitOps that are security, velocity, and reliability. Because of the um, tools of GitOps is like way to treat everything as code, it creates a direct impact on security. So if, um, for example, all configuration and security policy is treated as code, everything can be held in version control. So any changes that are made, reviewed, and input are um, put in, are done through an automated process. Um, there's no manual processes, so you're less likely to be at work on a weekend after a late Friday night deployment, um, manual deployment, where you're trying to figure out what went wrong. Um, and then moving on to... Next slide, sorry, Russ. Okay, so moving on to like, what is Flux? So Flux is a Git-centric package manager for your applications. But like I mentioned earlier, Git isn't the only system you can use. 
um, that provides a set of continuous and progressive delivery solutions for Kubernetes. It's a natural extension of the benefits of Kubernetes. And at, at the basic um, level of it, it continuously monitors your version control system, one of the options, and it applies the desired state that's been declaratively stated there. Um, and the nice part of this is that you don't have to worry about configuration drift because it reconciles on a schedule. So if things have gotten out of sync for some reason, it will set it back to the desired state. And it really reduces developer burden because it removes the need for manual deployment processes. And also the Flux CLI is a really convenient way to bootstrap the system in a cluster, bootstrapping um, to easily install it and um, manage it. And um, also to access the custom resources that make up the API as well. Um, I'll get to the questions in a, in a second, sorry. Uh, and then the next slide, yeah, okay. So uh, the these are some statements that we have on our website that we like to highlight about Flux. Um, we call them like the eight little statements that you need to know about Flux. Um, Flux provides GitOps for both apps and infrastructure, and uh, using Flux alongside Flagger, you can actually deploy apps with Canaries, Feature Flags, and AB rollouts. Um, Flux can also manage any Kubernetes resource, um, and infrastructure and workload dependency management is built in. You just push to Git, and Flux does the rest. Um, it manages deployments through um, automatic reconciliation, like I mentioned earlier. And then it works with your existing tools. So it works with your Git providers, such as GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. You can even use S3 compatible buckets as a source, OCI re repositories, um, uh, OCI registries, sorry, and uh, Helm re reg repositories, like m multiple things. Um, all major container registries and all CI workflow providers as well. Um, and it works with any Kubernetes and all common Kubernetes tooling. You can use Customize, um, Helm, RBAC, and it works with policy-driven validation such as OPA, Kyverno, admission controllers. So it really just falls into place with what you already have set up. Um, it also uh, does multi-tenancy. And as we like to say, multi-everything. Flux uses true Kubernetes RBAC via impersonation and supports multiple Git repositories. Um, you can also use multi-cluster infrastructure and apps, and they work out of the box with cluster API. Um, Flux can use one Kubernetes cluster to manage apps in either the same or other clusters, spin up additional clusters themselves, and manage clusters, including lifecycle and fleets. It also um, alerts and notifies, so it can provide health assessments and alerting to external systems and um, do external events handling. You can just like, you can also set it up to just get push and like, for you to get pushed and then you can get notified on Slack and other chat systems when a deployment has been made. Um, and users really trust Flux um, and hopefully through like this call, you'll understand why. And also like Russ and I both have that experience of being end users of Flux and um, we can both vouch for how awesome it is. And um, Flux has a lovely community that is very easy to work with. The um, Even from our experience as end users, it was really awesome if we had any like questions or anything, the involvement from the community is really great. And another thing is we welcome contributors of any kind. The components of Flux are on Kubernetes core controller runtime, so anyone can contribute and its functionality can be extended very easily as well. Um, and then the benefits of Flux are that Really, it reduces developer burden. It removes the, the cube control problem as well. So you don't have to worry about cube control versions to be able to interact with the cluster. Um, it's extensible, versatile. It works with existing tools um, and it's flexible. So it's like, it's very modular and it was created with Kubernetes in mind. So it's a really natural extension of Kubernetes. Um, because of the microservice architecture, you can pick and choose what you want um, out of it to tailor your own experience as well. And then um, next slide, Russ. And then, um, so like Flux is a set of Kubernetes controllers. And if you're not familiar with controllers, a controller handles the life cycle of objects in Kubernetes. So like what should be done when an object is created, updated, deleted, et cetera. Um, and so Flux uh, is made up of these controllers shown here. And then I also included um, the Terraform controller and the VS Code extension. So they're not um, actually part of the Flux project as Tamao mentioned, but they are, um, ways to extend your experience with Flux in the next slide. Okay, so uh, just a breakdown of what the Flux, what Flux's controllers do. 
Um, the source controller actually fetches resources and stores them as artifacts. So it's listening to the source that you tell it to, whether it be like a Git repository, OCI registry, whatever it is, and it stores what it pulls from there. And then the customized controller actually applies the manifests and it runs manifest generation using customized. So the reason it's called the customized controller is because it is, um, it, let's say you point it to a folder. It's actually by default going to be looking for a customization.yaml. And if there exists one, then it'll apply like whatever instructions you have in that customization.yaml. But if there isn't one, then it'll recursively search the um, folder path and it'll pull in any YAMLs it sees and basically create its own customized file in like within itself with all those files listed as resources. So that's why it's called the customized controller. And then the Helm controller does manages deployment of Helm charts and the notification controller um, handles uh, inbound and outbound events. It does notification dispatch. And then the image reflector controller reflects image metadata for, for the automation controller, which then updates YAMLs with when new container images are available. So they work together to update a Git repository when new container images are available. And then um, next slide. Okay, so Flux works with other tools. It works with all of these listed here and it works with a ton of other ones. Um, and there's tons that are constantly being added as well. But basically I just wanted to show that it works with all the tools you're already using. So it really just drops in nicely. And then the next slide. Um, this is just a, like a list of things of why I and others love Flux, things that I hear very commonly. Um, it really just makes your life easier. It handles your deployments for you. It also handles configuration drift. So you don't have to worry about your, your, your deployments. Um, and then multi-tenancy, as Russ is going to mention in a second, um, depends on is a really cool feature. If you're not familiar with it, you can basically set it up so that um, you can tell, you can say um, you want an application to, to, to wait for like the um, database to be set up or something. You can, you can set it up in like an order of events. Um, which is necessary in a lot of cases. And then um, the Helm integration is really awesome with Flux. It works really, really well. Um, notifications and alerts are really easy to set up. And um, Bootstrap is a really great way to get started with Flux and also manage it going forward to keep updating the version of Flux as well. And then the Flux CLI is really, really user-friendly in my opinion. And now I'm going to pass it over to Russ. All right, let's see if I can get everything started here. All right, so um, now we're gonna kind of you know, pivot a little bit and start talking about multi-tenancy and kind of how you can achieve multi-tenancy uh, multi um, with Flux. Um, specifically, though, we're gonna, there's, there's two types of multi-tenancy. There's um, hard multi-tenancy, uh, which is essentially everybody has their own cluster. Um, there it's, it, there's a physical separation between everything. You can still have, you have like a, you know, your operations team is designed to, create you know clusters for every team every team's got their own setup you don't need to worry about that tenant isolation as much because it's kind of handled automatically for you the other piece and that's the part we're going to talk about today is soft multi-tenancy and this is um basically this is all the experience that pinky and i had before um where you've got multiple tenants um in a single cluster that need to be isolated so that you know one team doesn't actually squash the app for another team or try to deploy the app for another team and it kind of isolate secrets and deployments and configurations and everything else um, that you need um, and then kind of out of the box um, flux by default does not have that enabled but it does support it and that's what we're going to talk about here is how actually how you do you enable it because uh, by default you kind of most people probably want flux to actually manage everything as far as a creating maybe ingress controllers secrets manager namespaces load balancers whatever the case may be um, but in a multi-tenant environment, you want to restrict that so that they, some teams can't do that. Oh, and it helps if I click the window. Oh, there we go. All right. So we're gonna get first thing. Let's kind of talk about like best practices on here. So the very first thing is doing is enabling the multi-tenant uh, tenancy lockdown, um, and this is done by within the Flux controllers themselves. You just enable this no cross namespace refs equals true, and what that means is that if I've got a customized object and a source object those pieces have to live within the same namespace i can't reference from one namespace the source to another namespace customization to another namespace um anything like that kind of uh, behind the scenes the controller does that enforcement to make sure that everything is isolated to where it needs to be um we kind of put a star next to that because that is kind of like the most 
critical and I kind of consider them the only like required piece of it <laughs> to make all this work. Um, and then there's some other best practices you can look into as well for like um, resource, um, resource isolation. Um, and this is actually talking about physical flux controller instances deployed to other areas to kind of isolate, um, you know, mission critical uh, tenants separate from, you know, standard users. Um, it's kind of worth noting, um, we'll have links to, the, to these uh, best practices at the end of the slide here, but I was gonna say it's worth noting that by default, the Flex CLI and some of the bootstrap commands don't really support this. So if you want to, if you do need to go down this route, you kind of have to roll your own, um, kind of like your own solution a little bit. And there's, it's documented in that guide as well. Um, the next piece you can look at too is like node isolation. Um, this is, you know, if you're doing like EKS, you're having like separate node groups for every tenant. Um, so you can actually, you know, kind of really isolate the back end um, as well so that you don't have like a shared node between the different um, applications. Depending on your use case, that may or may not be a critical issue. I'm assuming if you're in like, you know, highly regulated or like government sector, that might be a problem. May not be depending on your use case. Um, the other part is like network isolation. So ensuring that, um, you know, team tenants can't basically like backdoor themselves into another application and avoid security practices. So locking down, you know, service, um, service communication or whatever the case may be. Um, and just kind of making sure that your CNI is, is has that option configurable. Uh, going through here. So what does it take to enable tenant isolation with Flux? So this is kind of like the, the steps and the key pieces here. And when we show in the demo, we'll show all these uh, kind of in flight and how they work and why each of these is actually important. Um, so the first one I mentioned before was this no um, no cross namespace ref. Um, and like I said, that is just isolating the Flux resources themselves to make sure that everything is in the namespace they need to be and you can't cross paths. Um, the second one is you want to actually change the default service account. So by default, when you create a customization or a Helm release object, whatever the case may be, it's going to be use that the controller scoped account, if you will, and it's going to kind of have that cluster based access, the cluster access um, enabled out of the box. Um, we're going to change that and we're going to change that to be the service account. In this example, we use default, just about every namespace has a default service account, but you can change it to be whatever you want, depending on your use case. Um, and that's just to kind of, that'll help enforce some of that, the, um, the deployment isolation. Um, and then with that, the last step that we're going to do for, um, on this as well is down here at the end is actually change the customized controller. We still want that to have cluster level access. So that's going to be kind of the brainchild to go through between everything on the cluster. It's in the flux system. We want it to have control. We want it to be able to create new namespaces and create everything else that we need and create new tenants. So we're going to update that to use the actual customized controller service account, which it was configured to use automatically until we changed it here with this default. So we're basically just changing it back. So it's just a multi couple, like a three-step process here. So, all right, talk is cheap. Show me the code. Let's take a look at it here. Um, so now to set everything up, um, what I've done is I've already created a dummy cluster with some dummy resources and bootstrapped it all in there for the sake of time. So everything is set here and ready to go. Um, so right off the bat, I've got it set up on here. And so within your cluster, what you do is you go to uh, your um, Flux system customization, wherever you've, you've bootstrapped that into your um, uh, into your repo. Typically it's clusters, cluster name, Flux system customization, but wherever you've got it, um, go in here and just update the resource patches. Uh, don't worry about this one here. This is just for my own kind cluster. Uh, but the pieces that are important here is add this here. And the other point noting in here as well, this is a basic installation. So we're just going to patch the customized controller, the home controller, and the notification controller. If you've in, um, updated this to use like the image automation controller um, or anything like that, um, you would just need to update to include those as well. Um, can those be set from Flat Bootstrap? Um, from, unfortunately, no, not off the right off the bat. Um, and that's why you kind of have to do this after the fact. Um, it's an easy patch to do. And as the funny part is that when you add this through here, Flux will actually reconcile and fix itself, um, but it's not a part of the, the default configure, or configurable options at this time. Um, but let's show what this looks like in flight. So I've got a, oh, actually, you know what? I want to almost skip a step. Flux has got this concept that makes it actually, there's a CLI command you can use that makes it super easy to actually create new tenants with all the correct isolation and everything that it needs right off the bat. 
So if you're using the Flux CLI, you can actually do Flux, create tenant. I've created a, there's a dummy one. I'm just gonna call it team three. I've already created a team one and a team two uh, for use of this demo. Let's take a look, see what happens when we do a team three. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm actually just gonna export it. So don't actually create it. Um, and term is a little bit small. So let me open up one that already existed. Um, and if you take a look at the code here, this is what gets created. So it's going to go through and it's gonna create a new namespace with some tenant labels to know where you're at. Uh, a default service account that can be used and then role bindings as well as here um, as well for that service account to basically give that it's admin access, but it's a role binding. So it's scoped to the namespace. So it gives basically the service account out of the box. The permissions needs to do whatever it needs to do within that tenant, not outside, just within that tenant there. Um, the recommended way that I would suggest doing this would be to go ahead and say, you know, create your tenant, export it and pipe that output to a path in here that's reconciled by Flux. Um, commit that to your repository and you will actually see um, let Flux go ahead and create that new tenant. This is, again, the recommended approach. This is more of that true GitOps pattern. Everything's in Git, gets a source of truth. Let Flux reconcile it all through here. Uh, if you are in a, I don't know, a kind cluster for a demo <laughs> or anything like that, you can actually come in here and let me do this. Again, NS, just to show, we've got a couple namespaces here. There's team one, there's team two, there's a test one I was playing with earlier. Let's go ahead and just punt this. And just to show, now we got team three. And if I go look at team three, get SA. There's our service account, so it's got the default that comes along with it. There's the new team three. And we're gonna get the role binding. And there's the reconciler role binding that was created all automatically through here. So that's the simple process for actually creating a tenant and having it bound in here um, automatically. Now you can append this, however you wanna do this is kind of up to you. Uh, for, the example, for the example, I kind of created a new directory uh, for the team. And we're doing this approach, you kind of get the ability to not only have your team, but maybe you wanted to add new role bindings for users. And maybe you wanted to have a new user group that's set up to go through here. And that's just how you set up for, you know, anybody that's a part of the team one group has admin access to that namespace. You can do all of that within the tenant structure here. Um, and it, we can, you can add cluster roles, you can do uh, regular role bindings, whatever you need to do. Everything that happens in here is still flux system scope should, should be under the operator level shouldn't be the team actually controlling this, it should be whoever is the, you know, the cluster managers. Um, and they can configure exactly what needs to happen. Uh, I'm just going to delete this just to make it doesn't affect the uh, demo here later. Okay, so we've got everything set up. Go just to recap, we've got that initial configuration here. Um, I've gone through and I've created some for team one. I created a dummy, another dummy repo that's just here to kind of help set everything um, for for this example. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say, "Can team one, we got nothing deployed in here yet." I'm going to make this here, and you take a look, and you can see everything's reconciling just the way we expected. We come in through here um, within the customization that we've got defined. It's just using, we're gonna use the team one namespace. Everything is, everything's happy. Now let's say we tried to use the team two namespace and we try to pull something that actually doesn't belong within here. So out of the box right now, and then I'm also gonna use the flux reconcile command. Um, you don't normally need to do this, but for demo purposes, I'm doing it just to help things run a little bit quicker. And you can see everything applied, but if I go and say, get my customization, oh, that looks terrible with that going through here, but you can see it actually failed. So what we're looking at here is the team one repository failed and it was it failed because cross namespace references have been blocked. So even though it, it technically applied, um, Flux on the back end when it went through the controllers did not actually apply this change, um, which is exactly what we want. So let's go back and take this through here. 
let's just redo this. But we're also going to change something in here as well. And what happens if we change the deployment to be team two? So we, our customization is correct, but our app is misconfigured and it's going to try to deploy to the team two namespace. So let's go ahead and let's commit that. And push. And we're going to say flux reconcile. Do its thing. Let's take a look at team one again. And it's gone. And if we take a look at team two, it's here. So we have a there's a little bit of a gap. And this is where the next piece that we have here comes important is to actually change this default service account. So that by out of the box, even if my customization is locked down, there's nothing that's actually preventing the app from doing it because the service account that's behind the scenes has all the access that it needs. So we don't want this. So let's revert this back just to clean it up. Okay. Make sure team two is cleaned up, which it is. Let's take a look at team one, everything's back. Cool. So now let's change this. So we're just gonna comment this back out and add those extra pieces. And just to kind of recap again, it's just updating those, that default service account and then making the customized controller use the correct path on here. Now this actually will be a little bit of a breaking change if you have a current deployment for consumers. So. Um, and I'll show that here on the next step as well. So let's add this. And get push. Okay. So now everything's coming through. If I look at here, perfect. Everything's been restarted. But if we go back to what we were looking at here before, and let's do a flux get chaos. I know that it's really hard to see on here. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger on that. But you can see it actually failed. So given our current configuration, it's because the default account does not have the ability to do basically anything within this namespace. There's no closer, there's no role bindings associated with it or anything like that. So it'll fail. So this is what's kind of worth pointing out that if you're trying to enable this on an existing cluster, you need to be careful um, that you don't break any current tenants. Um, and what you have to do is within your customization, you need, can need to specify the exact service account name that you want to use. Um, and so in this case, we're going to switch it back and we're going to tell it to use the team one. We're going to use that same one that was created during that tenant uh, creation process that has the ability to do whatever it needs. If in your use case, you want it to have more restricted access, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but we're just gonna use the one that comes right out of the box here. So let's save this. Let's go ahead and do this again. Reconcile. Now, Let's go take a look at our customizations and everything's happy again. So everything came through, everything's reconciled correctly. If we take a look at our team one, we've got the right application here. If we take a look at team two, there's nothing here. Exactly what we want. And let's do the same situation we saw here before. Let's switch this back to team two and see what happens now. Reconcile. So again, it says everything applied, but if we go look at it, now we're seeing error messages again. So it's actually coming back saying that that service account, team one, the one that we configured on here, does not have the permissions to go through and cross and do cross namespace. If in your environment you deem that your account does need to be able to do so, that can be configurable with whatever role bindings you decide you want to put within here. But outside of the box, it's all gonna be locked down. Um, so again, if we go look at the team two, nothing's here. 
team one should still be working because it, they're obviously the reconciliation fails. So it just kind of sits there. Cool. Everything's happy. Everything's good. It's kind of weird though, that it's actually still deploying. It actually says that everything applied and it's just the backend stuff that's actually making this work. Well, we can fix that by using some of the other, let me just fix this real quick. Make sure this is on. Let's see here and make sure this is all happy. All right, okay, everything's happy again. So what you can do is on top of this, you can in, um, instantiate your own essentially policy agent. Now uh, for this demo, uh, we're gonna use Kyberno. Um, it's a great open source solution, at least to help get everything started. It's got a good policy catalog to kind of have some stuff out of the box that you can use. Um, or you can use open, you know, whether you're using OPA, uh, policy agent, whatever the case may be. The structure is all kind of the same. It gives you that extra layer of protection that you're looking at, that um, most tenants are gonna need. So what I've done is I've created this kind of generic policy and it's just a flex multi-tenancy po um, policy. And within here, it's going to enforce the exact same thing we just enabled on the controllers. So we're gonna come in through and say that any sort of customization or Helm release object, excluding those in flux system, is going to need to have a service account name provided that it's going to have to be required and any of the any of the customization or the helm release objects as well the source ref namespace has to match what was defined here before um, so again it's the exact same thing we're doing just defined as policy code so i'm going to come in here and i'm just going to add this back and we're going to let flux go ahead and actually deploy that policy And let's reconcile this. Okay, get cluster policies. Let's make sure it's here. Perfect. Everything's here. So now we go back to my team one demo that I had here. I've got an application that's defined with no service account, and it's going to go through and try to reference this other one. Now, for all intents and purposes, I'm just going to do a K apply here just to help speed things along a little bit rather than commit it. But if I apply it, it's not going to work. And you can see that right off the bat, our server is actually the, the validation has denied the request. So now it hasn't even gotten the flux to reconcile. It hasn't even, the resources themselves have not been created. Nothing is here. It's just blocked right off the bat. And it'll tell you exactly what's happening in here as well. Um, so let me just double check can team one get PO just to show we still just have our existing pod info one, which is correct. If we go ahead and take this out, try it again, it's going to fail again, just to kind of show that, yeah, it's, it's a layered approach. It, it does check for all. We're going to take this out. In this case here, we're instead of taking out the namespace, we're just going to specify it um, to be the same namespace. By default, if you do not provide this, it will be the same namespace, but I just want to kind of show that even if you did set it, as long as it's the same, it's still going to work. We'll go ahead and apply it. Customization was created. And if we go to team one, get PO now, you can see there's our fail. Uh, when it actually did get created successfully now, since we fixed all the errors, um, this was, it's a flex customization. So flex reconciled it correctly. So everything is working. So but kind of between those, you get that nice, layered approach to security. You've got that upfront one, um, you know, using like a Kyberno policy to make sure the stuff doesn't get in. If for some reason it does, you still got the flux uh, controller um, lockdown kind of to block all that as well. So you get this nice layered security model to kind of help make sure um, everything's isolated. And depending on your environment too, you can tweak this to whatever fits your needs. So if you have certain tenants that maybe do need some cross pieces and others that don't, that is configurable, um, gives you more of that flexibility with some of these policy agents as well. So let's go back. I think that's everything I had for the demo. Um, so just kind of tucking back the little bit of a recap here. Um, gives us a try. We have all the um, stuff that we kind of set up in here comes from most of the docs. There's even some um, GitHub repositories as well that have like a lot of starter code you can kind of play around with and just check everything out. Um, there is one thing down here at the bottom um, that they have, like Kyverno, I did mention before, they've got a really rich policy catalog. Um, they have the ability, um, this link here, 
is designed to uh, generate multi-tenant resources. So not only could you have it restrict, you can actually have it create, and you can have it set up to that every time you create a namespace, if somebody went through and created it by hand, um, you can actually have it create this exact same configuration than what you saw here. So if you were to create a new namespace, you can say uh, with that namespace, create a service account and create um, the cluster role binding and everything else that goes along with it um, as like a break glass scenario so that people can't even get in and basically like, you know, sideload new namespaces or anything like that. Um, you can do that. It's totally configurable um, and options to play with on there. And I think that's all we have. So do we have any other questions? Do you need multiple namespaces, multiple functions, and multiple service accounts? So if you want to do full tenant isolation, the best way to do it is multiple term, multiple namespaces, yes. Multiple service accounts, yes, for each of the namespaces. Multiple flux, no. Uh, by the default, though, in that configuration, that you can use that same core set of controllers to go through, at least with flux two, anyway. Uh, flux one is a little bit different, but flux two, what we're talking about is <laughs> that's the new one that's the good one use that one on there i think flex one is even totally i think it's retired now <laughs> so yeah, um yeah and so but you don't need that if you're in an environment where you need to absolutely have it there is options to kind of control it but like i said um from the bootstrapping perspective it's not kind of supported out of the box um if you're not trying to use multiple namespaces and you want to do some stuff like that it's it's doable, but you're not really in a multi-tenant there. It, it, the the RBAC is going to get way, way, way more tricky, and you're going to have to do things either by name or something along those lines. Um, way more complicated, <laughs> way more complicated to, to achieve. It's technically feasible. I just wouldn't recommend it. Um, I would recommend if you, if you have another team that needs something totally set up, do it in another namespace. I don't know what... I, I wasn't following super well. I don't know what the question was before where it said that can those settings be set from Flux Bootstrap? I'm not sure. Yeah, so uh, there's certain flags you can add during the Flux Bootstrap. And unfortunately, these ones are not. At least when I was looking at it yesterday, just to double check that the current version uh, supports it or not. Um, I'm not 100% uh, sure. I have to double, double check to see if it's on the roadmap. Um, it's an easy add. Um, like I just showed on there for doing like the patching uh, on there. Um, it's kind of hard to configure as well because there are some controllers that support that flag. There's some that don't, um, and it's hard to tell which controllers you're actually using. So that might be why it's not actually part of it, uh, depending on the use case. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking back at the questions. I don't know. So there was a question earlier, keen to understand more on best practices when developing a multi-tenancy flux control repo without potentially destroying all clusters. Um, blast radius could be widespread. Um, so usually, let me go to, yeah, let me take, kind of take a look. So this was my multi-tenancy repo that I created on here that has the notion of clusters and then my demo cluster. And then I've got all the multi-tenants and everything in here. Typically what you would see in here is you might have, like this should be managed by a core team, an operate, a, you know, um, Kubernetes operations team or something like that. This is not gonna be the end users going through. These are gonna be the, more of the, those cluster admins in here that should have access to this. Um, and you might have clusters, de uh, dev, test, prod, whatever, you know, fill in the blank that you have on through here. And then each one of those different paths will have Flux kind of bootstrapped into that as well. So it's not all gonna be, it shouldn't all be managed necessarily by, like they should have their own sets of customizations and everything else. So you should be able to make changes to one without blowing everything up, but the tenants themselves have their own file paths in here as well. So you can make changes to one tenant without blowing up another tenant. Now, if you've got, if you're talking about the concept of having like that infrastructure or apps to find in here that are global as well for like your, uh, maybe you got a help release for your like your um, ingress nginx um, or whatever the case may be, you're trying to do version updates for that. You do got to kind of be tricky um, just to make sure you don't uh, blow everything up for that. And you can either do that from a, per cluster has got this version and have that configuration on there. Maybe you have a common basis and then you're going to patch between all of those on there. Uh, but what from what we've seen, 
it's really hard to actually blow up an entire cluster unless you delete the entire repo. Yeah. Um, and you, you should have some safeguards around that to make sure, you know, like master or main is protected. So you can't just be, be deleted. Um, have everything kind of defined via, you know, restrict who has push access to, uh, to main and make maybe you know enforcing pull requests and certain sets of approvals to make sure that somebody has you know eyes on it as well to make sure that they don't accidentally you know adding a new team blows up another team whatever the case may be um and those are just kind of like good to delete repos at that point anyway. correct so. <laughs> in our experience nobody had access to delete only the repo <laughs> and and everything that went in through every, every nobody had access to push domain um every pull request had to have at least one approver on there, so at least you had one other set of eyes, and a, um, a user with approver access could not approve their own request. So there wasn't like a back door that you could say, "Hey, I'm an approver. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to make it happen." No, I would have to get Pinky's approval first before I could actually merge it in. So at least you got that extra set of eyes from on, again on that, that you know the core cluster um, scope as well. Um, and the other thing is like you point out to as well, Team One in here. This is not the directory that Team One actually gets to interact. Um, I created a whole new repo and I just kind of, that I actually called Flux multi tenancy Team 1. And they've mm -hmm. got access to do that. And so when they're in their namespace, they're bootstrapped and they're configured to do that. So they can still manage in their deployments and do whatever they need within their namespace without needing an extra set of approval. And if they blow up anything on there, well, they're blowing up themselves. They're not blowing up anybody else. <laughs> yeah, we, we had like an interesting setup. So we were using GitLab. Um, enterprise and we had already like the kubernetes team had a ui that you could go into to request a new namespace and like it would use the cluster like it would use the api and everything to add namespaces and everything but then we just kind of like went in and we just we didn't want to make the user experience any different so we went in and like had the ui still do that but then what the ui would end up doing was kick off a um pipeline a gitlab ci pipeline that would call to the flux um CLI to add, create a new tenant and push that up to the, to the um, folder to create a new folder for the namespace, then create the new tenant files. Um, and that's what we were doing there from our and side. We, we, had, we had a little bit of, um, by doing that approach, there was a little bit of uh, checks and balances in there as well. So within that pipeline, we could validate that that namespace didn't already exist and that somebody wasn't trying to take over somebody else's um, somebody else's tenant um, or anything it. like that and, and and all that process on there and so yeah, we there the approval process was already there we just basically tapped into what was yeah. uh, what was already in place just to make yeah. uh, so from from an end user perspective nothing changed their their flow and exactly was everything was was the same for creating the new tenants um, we just changed the the back end implementation um, and it worked really well and we never, there was never an instance where um, a cluster, full cluster got destroyed or anything like that. And, or, or a tenant got destroyed or anything like that. There was, we never ran into any of those issues. No. Um, so no. it's just kind of worth pointing out. I don't know if there's any other questions. Um... Oh, I think we're kind of getting to the top of the hour anyway. So. Yeah. Um... I guess I forgot to mention in the logistics in the beginning that generally these run um, 30 to 50 minutes. Uh, so I think we're at that point. Um, we end at the top of the hour if there's burning questions. So thank you so much everybody for your engagement and lots of really helpful questions. Um, thanks to Russ and Pinky for presenting this. And as we mentioned, um, we have these recorded, we have these on YouTube. So for all of you who've um, attended, you'll receive an email from Vanessa, our community manager, who has been here in the background setting these up for us. And um, yes, we'd love to continue to engage with you. So thank you so much. Thanks, Pinky and Russ. Thanks, Vanessa. And uh, we will see you all in 2023 for more great talks. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.